Uh, let me take just a few minutes to give you a quick uh, sort of landscape portrait of what the book is all about. I'll do this by uh, giving you five key thoughts at the heart of it, uh, of course, leaving out all the arguments and examples. Uh, as some of you know, a lot of my past work has circled around debates concerning scientific realism and anti-realism. Those debates are largely conceived of as being epistemological debates. They're debates about what we can know on the basis of our best science. But at an early stage, I became interested in uh, two themes that are really at uh, the, the forefront of uh, the new book, uh, Scientific Ontology. Firstly, some metaphysics is crucial to scientific realism. I mean, recall the, the etymology of the term realism much more generally, not just in the scientific domain, right? Realism connotes a belief in the reality of something. Uh, but it's not so easy to spell out what that means exactly, what the reality of something is. And in fact, it's impossible to do that without recourse to at least some metaphysics. And secondly, there's a deep sense in which our understanding of how much metaphysics is actually required right, to meet that demand of spelling out what the reality of something is or what it means to commit to the reality of something. There's a deep sense in which our understanding of how much metaphysics is required to do that involves certain choices on our part. So the book is my attempt to articulate uh, those two nascent themes, right? Hence the, the subtitle of the book, uh, which is integrating uh, naturalized metaphysics and voluntarist epistemology. So you have the metaphysics and the epistemology, which I think are interwoven with one another. And I think it's worth perhaps noting uh, a couple of things about this. Uh, one of them is that the project and the book is inherently metaphilosophical. Right? I mean, it's about the nature of ontological commitment. Um, and in part because it's about that broad theme, the second thing that's perhaps worth noting is that it goes well beyond the scope of debates about realism and anti-realism. Right? I think it pertains to the nature of ontological commitment uh, within that sphere, but uh, really is an attempt to grapple with the nature of ontological commitment um, out with that sphere as well. Everything from the most austere, you know, empiricist conceptions of ontology to the most profligate extravagant conceptions of ontology in analytic metaphysics. Okay, I promised you uh, five key thoughts, so here they are. Thought number one, there's no scientific ontology without philosophy. So consider uh, a lot of the contemporary views uh, that we find, uh, not least in the philosophy of science, that um, science should be informing philosophy or informing metaphysics if we're going to do the latter well. Well, I think that there's something right about this, but also something confused about it. Scientific theorizing and practice actually underdetermines its own interpretation. So we can't inform anything with science until we've interpreted the science, but interpreting the science involves some philosophical and metaphysical commitments. Okay, thought number two. There is, in fact, something wrong with analytic metaphysics. Uh, so consider the anti-metaphysical, anti-metaphysic stand that we find in much philosophy of science, right? Some of you were probably educated by uh, logical empiricists. Some of you probably still are logical empiricists in some way, shape, or form. Right? Um, but the fact that there's something wrong with analytic metaphysics, I think that's, it's true not in principle, as is commonly suggested, uh, it's true because of the way metaphysics is often done. And so uh, I describe this in part in the book in terms of what I call the exclusivity problem, the idea or the attitude that um, some metaphysicians take for granted, which is that they're doing work concerning the most fundamental uh, or more general features of reality, but without actually checking to make sure that actual bits of reality conform to their general and fundamental analyses. Um, one of the things that we do in the philosophy of science and in science is to actually investigate parts of reality. And 
if there's no check on actual bits of reality when speculating about the most fundamental and general bits of it, um, we have a problem. Thought number three, what I call metaphysical inference, by which I mean any reasoning which takes uh, as presuppositional a metaphysical commitment or that involves some kind of um, a priori reasoning. Metaphysical inference admits of degrees. So in the book I distinguish between what I call smaller M and larger M metaphysics. And this isn't meant to divide things up into two categories. It's meant to be a kind of continuum. You have kind of smaller M right, towards one end of the continuum and larger M towards the other. And often what people judge to count as metaphysics are really, I think, just reflective of descriptions of what size of M they feel comfortable with or what size of M they think is OK, where OK means something like being conducive to generating knowledge of the world. Thought number four, it is, in fact, uh, possible and in some cases sensible to combine realism with pragmatism. So one of the um, things I do in the book is to talk about cases in which uh, we can always describe in finer grained ontological ways the nature of something that we might be interested in. We might be interested in the existence of electrons and then shortly thereafter we'd like to know uh, what the properties of electrons are, and then we might be interested in yet finer grained questions about those properties. Are they intrinsic or are they extrinsic? Or, and you can imagine a kind of sequence of finer grained ontological questions that you might ask about things that a course, at a coarser level we've committed to in some sense ontologically. And what I want to suggest is that uh, realism at uh, uh, certain coarser levels of description, that is, realism about something at a coarser level of description is compatible with less than realistic attitudes towards finer grained descriptions of these things in terms of the various ontological uh, theorizing that we might then do. And some of these finer grained ontological bits of theorizing might be useful in pragmatic ways for thinking about these th things in different contexts of investigation or experimentation or what have you. Thought number five, many disputes about where to draw the line between uh, metaphysical inference that is a good bet for yielding truths about things in the world and metaphysical inferences that are not good bets for yielding truths about the world are irresolvable in principle. And that's okay. The idea that they must be resolvable is at the heart of a lot of uh, recent, but also perennial debates, right? There has to be a right answer to the question of how to distinguish between domains of theorizing in which we're likely to be able to generate truths or recognize things as being true or false, and domains in which we're probably not going to be very good at that, and we might instead just want to suspend belief. But I think that's confused, right? And this is where a kind of choice enters. Right? That's the voluntarism of the subtitle of the book, it's not doxastic voluntarism per se, which is something that's debated in epistemology, right? The idea that you can choose which beliefs you have. But it kind of functions in a very similar way. It's a voluntarism not about uh, beliefs in the first instance, but about what I call epistemic stances in the first instance. And as a downstream consequence, you end up believing different things, but it's really a voluntarism or a kind of choice about epistemic stances, which are, and I'm sure this is something we'll discuss at greater length, um, uh, commitments that are relevant to how we go about producing knowledge that I think can differ in different epistemic agents. <laughs>